What's up, future respiratory therapists? In this video, we're gonna be talking all about speaking valves, what you need to know about them, how they need to be applied, and things to keep in mind when you're taking your exam and taking care of these patients. Let's dive in. All right, so as I stated, we're talking all about speaking valves. Before we do that, do me a favor, check out the link down in the video description below and go check out the new respiratorycoach.com website where you can find a plethora of, of resources to aid you in passing your MBRC credentialing exams, as well as help with the mini courses just to help um, solidify and sure up some of the more difficult concepts throughout respiratory therapy school, such as pharmacology, arterial blood gas interpretation, all the different formulas as well as a link to go um, sign up for the free resources class that you will find there also just click enroll now and you'll see all the different options to choose from now let's talk about speaking valves but before we get into speaking valves we first have to understand just normal uh, airflow in and out of a tracheostomy tube because let's be honest here that's when we're talking about Speaking valves. You're not, you're not going to talk about a speaking valve uh, with an endotracheal tube. It's going to be purely a tracheostomy tube situation. So that's actually clue number one when you're when you're taking your exam or you're getting a report on a patient and somebody's talking about a speaking valve. You know that that patient has a tracheostomy tube. So let's just talk about this. This is um, what a tracheostomy tube looks like as it sits within the trachea. Uh, we've got our our vocal cords up here at the top. So we know that the artificial airway sits below the vocal cords and the larynx area in the trachea. Now, this tracheostomy tube here has a cuff and this cuff is inflated. So if I just fill this in here, you will see that um, all air movement in and out of this patient is going to go in this way and then back out this way. This is where all the airflow is going to be happening, okay? Why? Because gas follows the path of least resistance. And when you have a cuff inflated here like this, then what we realize is that there is no place else for the air to go out. It's going to go in, down to the lungs, and then back out of the artificial airway, in this case, a tracheostomy tube. Now, not all tracheostomy tubes have a cuff. If it doesn't have a cuff, it'll look like this one over here. You can see that we don't have this uh, illustration of the cuff on this side. Now on this side, again, path of least resistance, you can get airflow that comes in through the artificial airway, being a trach tube. You can also get some airflow that will come in through the upper airway. Again, path of least resistance. On exhalation, Airflow will leave through the tracheostomy tube and some might leave up and around the tracheostomy tube and out through the upper airway. That's normal. Okay, so normal functioning air movement. You have to know this so that we understand when these are indicated. If you have a patient who needs or requires mechanical ventilation, this isn't going to work because all the air pushed in is just going to turn and come back up and you're going to have a massive leak. And so we, we, got, we got to understand cuffed versus uncuffed and where the gas flow um, enters and leaves the lungs and through which route. Okay, now when we start talking about a speaking valve, then what we realize is that this is this device right here. So this is the speaking valve. And what we know is that there is a one-way flap built into the speaking valve. And this one-way flap is very, very important because for people to speak, we need airflow to go up through the upper airway, pass through the vocal cords so you can get that vocal cord vibration to get them moving so that they can then generate a sound or create a phonation. And so know that word phonate. It's uh, to make sound, to, to speak. And so uh, we need the air to move up through the upper airway and not go out through the tracheostomy tube. So what happens is, is when this patient inhales, air is allowed to come in through the one-way valve and it comes in and down and goes to the alveolar units. On exhalation, when the gas starts to come back out, this one-way valve closes. It's not, it doesn't let air come back through this way. So if the air tries to come back this way, 
it doesn't happen. That means all air is going to be pushed up through and past the vocal cords through and exhaled through the upper airway, normal anatomy. So that's how it works. Now the things to remember here are very simple uh, because that illustration shows a, a tracheostomy tube without a cuff. But we have to realize that when we have a cuff, remember this again now is inflated. And so this cuff is, 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 is inflated. When this person breathes in, air is going to come in and go to the alveolar units. When gas tries to come back out, it can't go back out this way. So it's going to try to come back out this way and it can't go out this way either. So what we see here is when the cuff is inflated, every single breath the patient takes, that breath is going to be trapped within the alveolar units themselves. And so one breath, two breaths, every single breath, there's going to be more. Try, try taking as many breaths as you can without exhaling. And that's what it's like with a passing mirror valve on with an inflated cuff, which is why we always want to deflate the cuff. You can see here, the cuff has now been deflated. So now when air comes in on exhalation, air can leave around the tracheostomy tube. It doesn't get trapped in there like it does when the cuff is up. That's the most important thing to note when you're taking care of patients with a speaking valve is that the cuff must be deflated. Egan's talks about this um, on page uh, 769, chapter 37. This is the airway management chapter. There's a rule of thumb. Egan's does a really good job of highlighting important concepts through a rule of thumb. It's a little box right here. It says the tracheostomy tube cuff must be completely deflated before a speaking valve is placed on the tracheostomy tube before it's placed on the tracheostomy tube. So that's, that's the key point there, is, is an understanding why does the cuff have to be deflated? It all comes back to this one-way valve right here that lets air go in, but not come out, okay? So let's, uh, let's take a look at a practice TMC or a practice exam question here. Um, I made this question. It's just something simple to kind of point you in the direction of, of when you're looking at exam questions, how you break down and make note of key elements that need to be picked up on. So here's how it goes. The respiratory therapist is caring for a 67-year-old female. Always, anytime they give you a gender, it's always important to, to, to note it. Uh, because it might matter. Okay, so we're going to say, okay, 67-year-old female with an 8.0 cuffed tracheostomy tube. Now, why did they tell you it was cuffed? Because it's part of the question. You, ha you have to demonstrate that you understand the complexity of what's about to be asked of you. After deflating the cuff, super important right here, after deflating the cuff, a speaking valve is correctly attached to the tracheostomy tube. After a few minutes, the patient develops respiratory distress, tachypnea, tachycardia, and signs of hypoxemia, which are the following is the appropriate action. Now, we've got data here, right? Now, when you're, you're, you're reading this question, it seems like the most obvious answer here would be to well, ensure that the cuff is deflated. Make sure, make sure that the cuff is deflated. Uh, but they've already told us that the cuff is deflated. They already said after deflating the cuff. So see, this creates a little different element of, of complexity to understanding how and what hazards might show up with a speaking valve and, and, and what we need to be aware of that might impact this finding right here. So let's, let's break it down here. Feel free to pause the video, answer the question. I'm going to go ahead and explain it to you. Should we continue to monitor the patient? Hmm. Remove the speaking valve and attempt another trial in two hours. Inflate the tracheostomy tube cuff. Remove the speaking valve and consider downsizing the tracheostomy tube. Now, let's break these down one by one. Continue to monitor the patient. Let me tell you a secret here, and it's not really that good of a secret. Anytime you have respiratory distress, tachypnea, tachycardia, and signs of hypoxemia, the answer is never going to be to continue to monitor the patient. The answer is going to include an action item, something we are going to do that is going to fix the cause of this problem. 
Okay, so it's not going to be to continue to monitor. Maybe we should remove the speaking valve. That we should do, 100%. We should remove the speaking valve. The correct answer is going to include that. And attempt another trial in two hours. Well, if, it's not the right answer. Okay, so I was gonna say if, it's not if nothing. It's not the right answer. Okay, if you have an area or a situation where you have, you're, 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 you're thinking upper airway edema, where you have a swollen airway around the tracheostomy tube, uh, there may be some interventions recommended to try to reduce the upper airway edema, but you still wouldn't re, you, you would come back and maybe try again in 24 hours, but not in two hours. Okay, so it's not, nothing, the problem here is not gonna be solved in two hours. Okay, so it's not this one, even though it started off really good. Inflate the tracheostomy tube cuff. Now there is always just an absolutely wrong answer. And this is that absolutely wrong answer in this scenario. And the reason I put it here is because as a, a student taking an exam, sometimes you can allow yourself to second guess what you're thinking. You know that this cuff has to be deflated and they told us it was deflated. But because this is now an answer, inflate the tracheostomy tube cuff, that's gonna allow a little bit of uh, doubt to creep in and go, well, maybe it's supposed to be inflated. Is it supposed to be deflated or inflated? And you know the answer is that it's supposed to be deflated. So you believe, you know that, you know this is just a bad answer, it's a terrible answer, it's not the answer, which only leaves us one. Remove the speaking valve. Again, I told you, that answer is 100% going to involve removing the speaking valve because that's what's going to help relieve this, all of this, what caused all of that? It started after we put the speaking valve on. And so if, if it started after we put on the speaking valve or placed the speaking valve, then we need to take the speaking valve off. And so we can at least take care of the patient in that realm by removing the cause of the distress, to tachycardia, tachypnea, and hypoxemia. Then it says consider downsizing the tracheostomy tube. Now my question is this, why would that even be an option on this exam or, or this exam practice exam question? Why would I, what, you always have to ask yourself that question, why is that even an option? Well, let's go back to the scenario and see why would they even give me the option to downsizing the tracheostomy tube size? And again, it goes back to female 8.0 tracheostomy tube. We know that based off of our artificial airway recommendations that females have smaller anatomy, therefore they'll require smaller artificial airways. So we know that for an endotracheal tube, we're thinking in the range of a seven to a seven and a half. And that same range isn't gonna change if you just go to a tracheostomy tube. If an 8.0 in the tracheal tube is too big for a female, in general, then an 8.0 tracheostomy tube is gonna to be too big or too large for a, a female patient. And that's what's happening here, is this large tracheostomy tube is occluding majority of this female's airway. And even with the cuff down, it's still obstructing the airway excessively and causing this blockage of expiratory flow leading to, 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 to this, these breaths being uh, trapped and the state of hyperinflation. Now, I wanna give you this illustration here real quick before I leave you because this is what we're talking about. This is a female patient with an airway but a tracheostomy tube that is too large so even with the cuff down, Look at the little bit of airway over here on the side that this patient has to get this airflow out. And it's not enough. This is what's creating as air comes in. It's trying to go out and a little bit may be coming out, but majority of it is like, well, I can't go this way. And there's only a little way to get out this way. And so that's what's imposing this increased work of breathing and creating this respiratory distress and tachycardia, tachypnea and hypoxemia. We downsize to a smaller trach. So look at the size here. See how wide this trach is? Now look at this trach. You can see now where we replace it with a smaller size tracheostomy tube. We keep the cuff deflated and now we've got ample room on both sides for gas flow to leave through the upper airway 
through the vocal cords and allow this patient to say something to their loved one. So keep that in mind. The appropriate size tracheostomy tube is also uh, equally as important as, uh, as recognizing that the cuff must be deflated. Here's our key points to this uh, presentation. Flow of air follows the path of least resistance. So the greater the resistance around that artificial airway, um, that's where gas flow is uh, going to be impeded. So remember that always. Uh, anytime you're utilizing a speaking valve, don't just think, oh, it's got to be the cuff. We know we have to deflate the cuff 100%. Always, we also need to assess for the appropriateness of the tracheostomy tube size. And then also we can consider changing to a cuffless tracheostomy tube if mechanical ventilation is not needed or indicated for a cuff trach. Or we also could maybe potentially aid a patient with a fenestrated tracheostomy tube, which I'll talk about in another video. And then always assess your patient routinely. This is not a once and done assessment. You're not going to put this, put the speaking valve on the patient, watch them breathe for two minutes, leave the room and not assess them again. Anytime you implement a speaking valve, no that any type of upper airway obstruction, whether it's the cuff, too large of an endotracheal tube, excessive secretions, anything is going to impede that expiratory, um, that, that expiratory phase, that expiratory uh, gas flow up through the upper airway and it's gonna cause distress on your patient. So you gotta keep an eye on these patients. Those speaking valves with tracheostomy tubes. I'm a respiratory coach. Stay right here with me on YouTube. Uh, do me a favor, hit the subscribe button if you haven't already done something. So, I mean, the worst thing that's gonna happen is you get an occasional weekly video about something related to respiratory care education. So do, me, do that favor for me, as well as uh, leave me a comment. I'd like to hear what you think about this video. And uh, if you have any recommendations for future videos, please do so in the comments section. Come follow me on social media, Instagram, TikTok at Respiratory Coach, LinkedIn at Joe Lewis. And here we go. New email, joe at respiratorycoach.com. Go check out the website. Remember, average is easy. Don't be it.